Hey friends, thanks so much for clicking on this video and watching one of our Catch Fire London services. We really love giving out all of this content and resourcing the churches. If you would like to sow into our ministry and give online or give through one of our, our websites or our app, then we really would love to encourage you to do that. There's information on this video for how you can do that and we would gladly receive your support. Enjoy the sermon. Just before I get started, uh, welcome to those of you who are visiting with us or, or new here. It's good to have you with us. Um, just a bit of family news. Uh, many of you will know Phil and Hannah Hammond, who are our amazing children's pastors. And I have some sad news, which is that they are going to be leaving us. They're going to be moving on, which is really sad news for us. They've been uh, serving our church family incredibly, uh, obviously at the morning service where the, where the kids work runs uh, since September, and they've been an incredible blessing to us. They were very much an answer to, uh, or a, a, a fruition of the prophetic word that Mark DuPont uh, gave us around that time of, of high caliber people coming in uh, and serving the body, and they've, they've been incredible. Uh, Fire Kids is the fastest growing ministry in our church. On average, we're getting about 40 kids every Sunday upstairs. It's mayhem. Um, we do need more people to help with the kids' work. Um, if you have a heart to help uh, with kids' work, please come and see me. I'd love to put you in touch uh, with the people who are going to be coordinating that in the interim. Um, if you don't have a heart for kids' work, then please pray for yourself to get a heart for kids' work. And then come and speak to me afterwards because we really do need help. They're not tomorrow's generation. They are part of our church family today. Um, all of the people that not everyone on the speaking rotor knows this yet, uh, so it's great to find out things, uh, you know, when they uh, get said down the microphone from the front. But anyone who uh, is going to be on our speaking rotor is going to be expected to teach the kids. Um, and, and, and that comes from a desire that they not be seen as kind of, you know, we, we said right from the start, we don't want them just upstairs being entertained while the adults do the serious stuff. Uh, the charge I gave Hannah and Phil, I said my deepest desire for the kids' ministry would be that the adults are playing catch up with the kids. Um, and, that, and that's kind of, to me, that would be the, the goal would be that because they, they don't have half of the junk and half of the filters that we have as grown-ups and they're operating in their innocence in the, in the gifts of the spirit. But please, we do need more help. So do come and speak to me. We're also going to be advertising for a new children's pastor. So if you know anyone who might like that job, then send them this way. Uh, but we're going to do an official goodbye to Phil and Hannah and, and have an opportunity for people to bless them and send them on their way. But do send them some love. Do send them some prophetic words and encouragement as they kind of... Uh, change change seasons as they enter a new chapter they need uh, love and support and we are sad to see them go definitely but absolutely excited that God is very much on it and the confirmation they're getting that they're stepping in the right direction is really encouraging so bless them amen okay well we are um we are closing off a series. We've been looking at the I Am statements. Mary uh, finally took pity on me and my awful PowerPoints. Um, I, I, feel, I feel like it's sometimes, you know, if you do something badly enough, enough times that someone will just do it for you. I, I took that approach with ironing when I first got married. Don't tell Abby. I'm actually really good at ironing, but she thinks I'm terrible. And I just did it so badly so many times. She's just now, oh, forget it. I'll do it. And I've taken this approach with my, uh, with my PowerPoints. So Mary's finally taken uh, pity on me and, um, and is, has designed me some lovely slides. But um, we're, we're closing up this I Am series. And uh, I want to look tonight at the, the seven I am statements of Jesus uh, in the Gospel of John. And deliberately, we're going to fly through. We're not going to spend much time on, on any of them. But at the end of each one, I'm going to do a very short ministry time. So instead of having one big ministry time at the end, we're going to have lots of little ones. And, and as, it's, uh, as, as Holy Spirit is speaking to you as I speak, uh, as we do that little ministry time, if you want to respond, you can just jump up and, uh, and receive that. And we're going to pray for you uh, right where you're stood. So um, I'm, I'm going to fly through a bunch of stuff just in the interest of time. Uh, but this first, um, this first kind of look at the Gospel of John and this idea of um, John using the I am statements and what he does, there's seven I am statements and there's seven miracles that he ties to the I am statement. So the I am statement, as you know, through this series, whenever uh, God says I am, he's, he's speaking about his nature, his character. It's not I do, it's I am. I don't just provide, I am provider. I'm not just loving, I am love. You know, I'm not just going to give you bread, I am the bread. I am the very bread, as, as, as Ellie was just talking about. And John links these, um, links these I am statements to these miracles. And what happens is, ooh, dun, dun, dun. why don't we all just take a second? Just bear with me. I've lost. Da -da, here we go. Right. I am. So the Gospel of John. So these I am statements, I'll just go through them quickly. I am the bread of life, John 6, 35. I am the light of the world, John 8, 12. 
I am the door of the sheep, John 10, 7. I am the resurrection and the life, John eleven twenty five. I am the way, the truth, and the life, John 14, 6. I am the true vine, John 15, 1. And I am the good shepherd, John 10, 11. And so as we look at each of these, I'm going to talk. Oh, I've, I numbered them one just because uh, it seems like every time I try to order something, I always get it wrong and, uh, and just order them all as one. But someone told me they're all equally important. So now from this day forward, whenever I uh, do a list on PowerPoints, I'm going to definitely number them one, 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 one. Um, but each time we're going to look at the I am statement of Jesus and we're going to look at the miracle. But the heart would be that every time we see a miracle, every time Jesus operates in the miraculous, I believe there's an invitation to see something about the nature of God revealed. Now, the, the, the signs and the wonders, the miracles were, were, were done by Jesus to demonstrate the glory of God, to demonstrate the kingdom, uh, to back up as an authority for what he was saying so that you believe you know, stand and, and walk, you know, see in the name of Jesus. But also when we see a miracle, we, we get to see something about the nature of God. It's a manifestation of the kingdom being superimposed on the earth. Uh, and we've talked before about how your mission, your mandate, your mantle as a believer is to, is to manifest the kingdom of heaven onto the kingdom of earth. I did a talk once about top trumps. I don't know if you remember that. And we were saying whenever, you know, as Christians, we have top trump cards that have 10 on every single category. Whatever's going on in the earth that which is going on in heaven should trump it. There's no cancer in heaven, so there shouldn't be any cancer on the earth. And so when we pray, as Jesus taught us, kingdom of God come, will of God be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so this idea that Jesus is manifesting when he operates in the miraculous, he said, didn't he, that he can do nothing of himself. And so everything he's doing is a, is a manifestation of the power of the spirit through him. But it's a representation of that which is in the kingdom of heaven being superimposed onto the kingdom of earth, the now and the not yet of the kingdom being manifest on the earth. And so as we go through these quickly, um, what I want you to do is just have your spirit alert. And when you see something, and we're going to do these ministry times, when you see something of God, if you feel like you have a need in that area, if you feel like you need fresh revelation of God in that area, just allow your spirit to be quickened that as I, as I tell you about Jesus, to know that he wants to manifest that in your life today. Amen? Okay, cool. So the seven I am statements, we've gone through those. And, and, and of course, Jesus saying I am, um, he's, he's echoing the words of, uh, of God um, speaking with Moses at the burning bush, Exodus 3. I taught on this a few weeks ago. And, and it was actually Jesus speaking to Moses from the bush. It says, the angel of the Lord spoke to Moses from the bush and, and, and identified himself as I am. I am that I am. I, I am who I am. I am who I've always been and I, will, I am who I will always be. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He has no shadow of turning. And so every time that Jesus says, I am, for the, for the religious leaders, it, it was blasphemy because he was equating himself with God. And so, again, you know, understanding when he says, I am the good shepherd, that's talking about his nature. It's talking about his character. It's who he is. It's his very essence. It's not just something he does or some kind of weak metaphor. He's saying, this is actually who I am. I am the bread of life personified. That's who I am. And so the seven miracles with the seven statements. Uh, the first miracle is the changing of the water into wine. And that matches up. Amen. Come on. One person. Good miracle. You know, I, I was praying this at the start. When, 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 the, um, when Jesus changes the water into wine, and we'll talk about this in a minute, the, 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 the um, host uh, says, most people bring out the choice wine first. And then bring out the cheaper stuff once the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till. And, and, and I think most of us often think of that phrase being the best till last. That's the phrase, isn't it, in English? Oh, you saved the best till last. But that's not what the, the um, host of the party says. He says, you have saved the best until now. The kingdom is now. And the kingdom is not yet, but the kingdom is now. So just why don't you take a second and just thank Jesus. Thank Holy Spirit. Thank Father. That he's about the now. That it's not just the pie in the sky by and by, but it's the steak on the plate while you wait. He is the now God, and he's here. He's the abundantly available God. And wherever you're at, he wants to meet you today. And I just feel like there's someone here who's, who's come here tonight, and you're just at the end of your tether. You're just at the end of your rope. And I just feel like you need to hear that he's the now God. And he wants to meet with you now. Not when we do ministry time at the end, even just right now. So Holy Spirit, would you move in this place? Changing the water into wine. I am the true vine. 
The healing of the official son on the way to Capernaum, Jesus demonstrates the statement, I am the way, the truth, and the life. When he heals the invalid at the pool of Bethesda, um, it's next to the sheep gate. He's demonstrating, I am the gate for the sheep. When Jesus feeds the 5,000, he is quite literally the bread of life. When Jesus restored the sight of the man born blind, he's showing to us that he is the light of the world. When Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead, he's showing us, I am the resurrection and the life. And when Jesus himself is raised from the dead, he's showing us, I am the good shepherd who lays down his life for his sheep. So I am the bread of life. Jesus feeding 5,000 people with five loaves and two fishes. My friend told me the other day, that's tapas. That's not a miracle, that's tapas. I love that. John 6, 35, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. And as Ellie was saying, Jesus draws this parallel like the manna in the desert, the manna that was provided, Exodus 16, 4, the bread from heaven sent to sustain the nation. And as it is with Jesus providing the physical need through the manifestation of the miracle, the, the multiplication of the loaves and the fish, he's also demonstrating his desire to meet a spiritual need, the manifestation of himself as the bread of life itself. Jesus was saying the manna was meant to be a model of the Messiah. And we've taught on this before, how many times in the Old Testament, and there's something that happens in the Old Testament that pre-shadows or prefigures something which later happens in the New Testament. Um, Alistair was referencing this morning the, the test that Adam had in the garden and failed and brought, brought mankind into sin. And then the test that Jesus had in the garden and passed and brought redemption to mankind. And in the same way, this manna was a, a prophetic symbol of what Jesus would later do and later be. Whoever partakes of him will never again know spiritual hunger. And like the manna, everyone who seeks him will find him. Everyone who sought the manna found the manna. And in the same way, everyone who seeks Jesus will find him. But each of us has to find him for ourselves. Do you remember you couldn't store up the manna? You had to just take enough that was what was needed, exactly the right amount. And in the same way, the bread that Jesus offers up of himself, he's the bread of life, just exactly the right amount for each and every one of us. We all get an amount sufficient for our salvation. Who here is glad that Jesus did just well, he did more than enough, but who knows that each and every person, Jesus has done what is sufficient for our salvation. Each of them ate their fill. I love that when it says that the, uh, the bread uh, was multiplied, the fish was multiplied, and each and every one of them ate their fill, and there was still an abundance left over. And Jesus, the bread of life, was born in Bethlehem, which means the house of bread. I love that. Jesus said to them, verse 32, very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who's given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And just in providing the physical bread, he was also demonstrating that he was to be the spiritual bread. And then we see it um, in John 4 when Jesus speaks to the woman at the well because we talk about the hunger being satisfied. But we also talk about the thirst being satisfied when Jesus meets the woman at the well, John 4. And uh, he says to her, pointing at the well of Jacob, he says, uh, everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again. But anyone who drinks of the water that I give will never thirst again. Psalm 42.1, as the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you. I was telling the morning congregation this morning, there's, a, there's a, 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 an urban myth, a legend in High Wycombe where I grew up, that there was a worship leader leading worship once and was singing as the deer pants for the water. And in a moment of exuberant, spontaneous worship, shouted out, Jesus wants your pants! And then realized what he'd said and looked horrified. We've all had that moment. I once sang, um, I was leading worship once, and I was, meant, I was singing, Our God, Water You Turned Into Wine. And, and I couldn't remember whether it was Our God is Greater or Our God is Stronger. And I just mixed up the two in my head and sang, Our God is Straighter. And it was just, it was like the most super awkward moment ever in worship. In Jesus, our spiritual hunger is satisfied and our spiritual thirst is quenched. When John used the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus declared himself to be the bread of life. And John brings that miracle and that statement together to show us Jesus has the ability to meet our physical need, but Jesus also has the ability to meet our spiritual need. And so if you are here this evening and you, you have a, a, a need in the physical for provision, or you have a need in the spiritual for provision. Now, I know technically we could all have a need in the spiritual for provision, but you know what I mean. Like you are, you're feeling either spiritually dry or you have a physical need for provision. I'm just going to ask you to stand really quick, and I'm going to pray for you right where you are. So Jesus, I thank you. You are the bread of life, and for each and every one of my brothers and sisters stood. Why don't you just receive, just begin to receive from God by faith. Bread of heaven, bread of heaven, feed me now and evermore. Feed me now. Thank you, Jesus. 
we recognize you as the bread of life in this place. And for every need in the natural, give us today our daily bread, we ask. And for every need in the spiritual, we eat of you. And we are by faith. We, we take it by faith that we will be satisfied. We drink of you. And we take it by faith that our spiritual thirst will be quenched both now and forevermore. Amen. You may be seated. I am the light of the world, John 8, 12. Jesus did not say he was the light of the world just so that Tim Hughes could go platinum. He was declaring himself to be the light of the world. Jesus was claiming that he is the exclusive source of spiritual light. This is random, and I don't know why I'm saying this, but I feel someone needs to hear this. I read an interview about Tim Hughes once, and he never in his life has put himself forward or asked to lead worship anywhere. And I just felt someone needed to hear that tonight, that you are worried about, is there room for you? Is your gift going to, gonna, are you going to be able to operate in the gift that God has given you? And I just felt for you, you know who you are, that the Lord is saying, you don't need to promote yourself because he's the lifter of your head, and he is going to make room for you to be who he's called you to be. So just receive that by faith. Jesus is the light of the world. He was claiming that he's the exclusive source of spiritual light, healing the, uh, the eyes of the blind man, the man uh, blind from birth. I don't think, I'm not aware of any time in the Old Testament where someone was, who was blind from birth was healed. Um, and, and the eyes being opened, the, the eyes of the blind being opened was a sign of the Messiah. And there's so much uh, amazing symbolism in this miracle. And Jesus tells the man to go and wash in the pool that's named Shiloh, which uh, is a form of Messiah. And, and what we're seeing here is that his physical eyes are opened, but also his spiritual eyes are opened. The blind man received sight physically, and it led him to receive his sight spiritually. And again, what John is doing by bringing these two, this miracle and this I am statement together, he's saying Jesus has the ability to, feel us, uh, to, to heal us physically, to feel us physically, no, that doesn't work, to heal us physically, but he also has the ability to open our eyes spiritually. And, and, and we see this beautiful picture, but it's interesting that the Pharisees, who are the ones who claim to possess spiritual sight, are the ones who are actually spiritually blind. And, and we see here Jesus demonstrating that it's the, it's the people who come humbly before him who have their spiritual eyes open. Think about Nicodemus in John 3, uh, the symbolism there, that he's the teacher of Israel. He, he, Jesus says, you're the teacher of Israel and you don't get these things? And he comes, doesn't he, in the night. It symbolizes the darkness that he's walking in. And then exactly the next chapter, John 4, the woman at the well who comes in humility Go, fetch your husband. And she says, I have no husband. She humbles herself before God. And it's her that receives the spiritual enlightenment. And she comes 12 o'clock noon, the light of the day. Think about the symbolism there, the, 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 the Pharisee, the teacher coming in the darkness and the humble coming in the light and, and, and the humble receiving the spiritual enlightenment. Three times the former blind man who's truly gaining knowledge, he humbly confesses his ignorance. And three times the Pharisees, uh, they're plunging deeper into their ignorance of Jesus. And three times he professes his humility. And three times they demonstrate their arrogance. But Jesus is showing that he opens the eyes physically of the blind. But with that comes the opening of the spiritual eyes. I love that. Does anyone here need physical healing for their eyes? Would you stand? We're going to pray for you. That would be, I mean, by definition, anyone who wears glasses, by definition, that would be some form of healing required. So be blessed. Sorry, I know it's kind of not easy to hide when you're wearing glasses. You might have contacts in. You can just, you can, that's fine. You can go for it. Um, and, and also, I just felt that anyone, and again, this could be something that, or probably should be something that we would all stand for, but someone who has a very genuine desire to have your spiritual eyes opened, like it's actually something you've been asking God to do recently. Uh, like Paul prays in Ephesians 1, the eyes of your heart would be enlightened so that you would know him better, but you've actually been asking God specifically for your spiritual eyes to be opened. So Jesus, we thank you that you are the light of the world. We thank you that you heal blind eyes. We heard testimonies last week of you healing blind eyes in the natural, physical healing. And so right now I just speak healing to every single eye here that's not operating as it should be. I don't believe we're going to be wearing in glasses in heaven. So kingdom of God, come now. Will of God be done right now. 2020 vision in the name of Jesus. Full healing. And also for the spiritualized God that you would, that you would heed that prayer of their heart, that they would have their eyes enlightened, their spiritual eyes, the eyes of their heart, that they would know you better. Spirit of wisdom come, revelation be released to you, the unveiling of your eyes to see him clearer. 
with the deepest desire of your heart. Just uh, hit, echoing the, 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 the words of Jesus on, on the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness because they will be satisfied. I just bless that hunger and that thirst in you to see more of God, to behold him in his beauty, in his glory, in his splendor. Eyes of the heart be opened. Physical eyes be opened, be restored, be healed in the name of Jesus. Light of the world. Amen. <laughs> ah, I am the true vine, Shanice. Come join me, won't you? This is Shanice. She's our young adults pastor. She's great. Uh, she's just going to talk really quickly just about um, Jesus as the true vine. Uh, and the, um, the miracle that matches with this is obviously the, the, the water into wine at the wedding in Cana. But uh, just as, as you hear Shanice talk about Jesus being the true vine, just be asking him, what does this look like for you? How are you going to apply this to your life? How are you going to see the manifestation of Jesus saying, I am the true vine, be made real in your life today? Hello. I'm going to really quickly read a tiny bit of John 15. It says, I am the true grapevine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit, and he prunes the branches that do not bear fruit, that they will produce even more. You have already been pruned and purified by the message I have given you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine, and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, I am the vine. You are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. And I love that his first miracle just shouts, I am the vine. He is the provider of the, the fruit that comes from the vine in this miracle. He provides the wine at the wedding. And I also love that actually in um, Hebrew tradition, it was the bridegroom's responsibility to provide the wine at the wedding. So again, it's just another shout of, I am the bridegroom. My first stance shouts, I am provision. I am the only provider. I'm not creating this from the physical, but I'm coming in the supernatural and I'm providing straight out. I love that so much. Um, yeah, he is the root of life. He is the source of our life. Verse 5 says, apart from me, you can do nothing. That's kind of humbling and you can kind of rest assured that actually you need him. And I think that's such an amazing place to get to when you can acknowledge, I can't do this by myself. And that's often when he breaks through because he's like, finally, you've given up. You've realized that it's not in your own strength. You can't do it in your own strength. What was the point in him coming and dying if you can do it in your own strength? So even just, yeah, take a moment and just receive that and even just acknowledge, I can't do this in my own strength, whatever it looks like, just life. I can't do it in my own strength. And just take a sigh of relief, because actually that is a great thing, that we have to rely on him. He is the only source that takes the pressure off of us. It's all him. Yeah, he is our constant provision. I love that it says that we bear the fruit. We carry the fruit. We don't produce it. We don't need to squeeze really hard until something comes out or something is produced. We just bear it. We are the ones that, that carry it. He is the one that produces it. So again... Just receive that freedom from producing this fruit because actually the fruit, even the fruit, the wine, the blood, it all speaks of him. Everything that he produces speaks of him. It's filled with him, so it has to come from him. So just let that, yeah, just sit in your heart. He is the seed that died so that we may have life in him. Just turn to the person next to you and say, in him. Amen. Amen. Verse 3 says, you have already been pruned and purified by the message I have given you. When we receive his word and remain in his truth, we get rewarded. We get to carry the fruit filled with God's DNA. And I love this. There's so many times in the Bible where he gives us a command and then we get rewarded for it. It's like your parents saying, here's a meal. If you eat it, then I'm going to give you my credit card and you can go shopping. And that's it's kind of what we do. We take him, we... Um, we behold him and we become what we behold. We, we eat from him. We eat this bread of life. We drink from him. And actually, I love that even food, when we eat it, it actually breaks down and becomes a part of us. And that's the same as we behold Jesus, as we eat of the bread of life, it breaks up and it actually provides nutrients to every cell in our body. And that is a spirit, an amazing spiritual just, um, just vision of what he is for us, what he does for us. And that he doesn't ask us to go and be and do all this stuff. He's just like, just abide in me, abide in me. Seek first the kingdom of God and everything will be added unto you. Just abide in me. So just say to yourself, abide in him. Abide just speak to your soul and say, abide in him. 
Amen. Thank you, Jesus. And I just want to share like a really quick testimony. Um, I've struggled with like health stuff for a while and it's kind of just been really frustrating and I've been trying to contend and wondering what it looks like. And I got to this place um, a few months ago where God just said, you need to believe that I love you enough to heal you. And I just really felt that there are some people in the room today that, that really need to just know that he loves you. That if you didn't do another thing on this planet, that knowing that he loves you would, would be incredible. It would be so satisfying and so fulfilling. And I also kind of made this excuse like, God, I believe that you're going to do it someday. I just don't know when. And I realized that I was actually using that as an excuse not to be vulnerable for today. And I feel, again, there's other people in the room that are saying, I believe you'll do it, God. I believe you'll do it. You'll do it one day. I believe in you. I know who you are. But actually, you haven't got to that place where, yet where you're saying, God, I believe that you're going to do it today. I'm going to be vulnerable, and I'm going to actually put faith in this. Faith is risk. Faith equals risk. And it is so vulnerable saying, God, I believe for today. Because if it doesn't happen, then what? So I just want to encourage you. That's, that's going to be the ministry that we're going to do right now. Um, Imagine we believe that he is who he says he is. Imagine like how different your life would look, how different the world around you would look. And we're all on this journey, but I just really want to just quickly pray into this, pray into the today. And I want you to just put your heart out on the line and just choose to be vulnerable in this moment. Choose to decide, God, I'm going to believe for my provision today. I'm going to believe for my healing today. I'm going to choose to put myself out on the line and trust that you are the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, that you are who you say you are. So yeah, I just invite you right now, if that's you, I, I mean, it's probably all of us that are kind of waiting or, or don't fully believe that he, he is who he says he is, but I just want to ask you to stand and just be bold and just choose right now in this moment to say yes. God, I'm going to choose to be vulnerable. I'm going to choose to put my heart out there. Because you want relationship with me. You don't just want to give me stuff because I want it, but you actually want to do the journey with me to get there. God, I pray that you'll bless every single heart in this room and every single mind in this room, Father, to know that you are the one true living God that cares and loves them. Father, that they will feel your love so powerfully right now, Jesus, in their hearts. And that as they just open themselves to you, Father, that you will give them the strength. God, you as the true vine will give them the strength, Jesus, to believe for that miracle today. To believe for that breakthrough today, Jesus. And I thank you that it is your faith, Father, that you give us that measure of faith. It's not even faith that we need to muster up, God. But will you help us just receive that faith for this miracle right now in the name of Jesus. Amen. So good. Thank you. Please be seated. Ah, Okay, just the last few. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Not a way, not a truth, not a life, but the way, the truth, the life. John 14, 6. And Jesus talks about this um, at the Last Supper. And he's, he's, Judas has already uh, left uh, to, to make his betrayal complete. And Jesus is talking to them. He's saying, I'm going to prepare a place for you. you, you uh, where I'm going, you cannot follow. And John uses the uh, healing of the nobleman's son to, to draw a parallel. Uh, and, and this, I'm just going to read from this quickly. This is John 5, sorry, John 4. Uh, I'll go from verse 46. Once more, Jesus, he visited Cana in Galilee, where he had turned the water into wine. And there was a certain royal official whose son lay sick at Capernaum. When this man heard that Jesus had arrived in Galilee from Judea, he went to him and begged him to come and heal his son, who was close to death. Unless you people see miraculous signs and wonders, Jesus told him, you will never believe. The royal official said, sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus replied, you may go, your son will live. And then just something that happens immediately after this, which would seem like a real throwaway thing. This is really profound. So Jesus says, you may go, your son will live. And then it just simply says, the man took Jesus at his word. The man took Jesus at his word and departed. And I feel like sometimes we're so busy asking for Jesus to do the thing, and he's already done it, and we just need to take him at his word sometimes. And then, interesting from here, that 
It says, uh, the man took Jesus at his word and departed. And then verse 51 says, while he was still on the way, his servants met him with the news that the boy was living. So this is Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life, okay? Jesus is the, the, and. Verse 51, while he was still on the way, his servants met him with the, the truth, the news, that his boy was alive. While he was on his way, his servants met him with the truth that Jesus had imparted the life. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. I want to take Jesus at his word. I want to believe that he is who he says he is, and he does what he says he does, and that when he speaks, it's as good as done. Jesus only ever said what he heard the Father saying, and Jesus told us that Holy Spirit would remind us of all the words that Jesus has said. And so I wonder how often we just need to take Jesus at his word. And like Shanice was saying, just dare to believe that if he said it, it must be true. Psalm 119, 142 says, your law is the truth. If you have, if you feel like you've lost your way, if you feel like you've lost the truth, and if you feel like you are not living in the fullness of life, I'm going to ask you to be brave and stand up. I want to pray for you. If you feel like you've lost your way, if you feel like you've lost the truth, and if you feel like you are not living in the fullness of life that God has for you, then I want to pray for you. Thank you. Be encouraged. The less of you there are, the more there is to go around. Spirit, would you come? To those who feel like they've lost their way, I bless you to know that Jesus is the way. You really haven't lost your way because he's leading you and his leadership is perfect. Spoiler alert for the next two I ams. He's the good shepherd. He's the one who looks after us. You haven't lost your way. And for those of you who feel like you've lost the truth, I just bless you to receive the truth. That he is with you and he will never forsake you. He will never leave you. He's the friend that sticks closer than a brother. He's with us until the end of the age. And forevermore. And for those of you who feel like you're not living in the fullness of life, I bless you to know that Jesus came that you would have life and have it in abundance. And where the enemy has sought to steal, kill, and destroy, be encouraged. Because you can't steal something someone doesn't have. You can't kill something that's dead already. And you can't destroy something that isn't full and whole. And so anything that the enemy is trying to steal, kill, or destroy is there. And that's the truth. Be blessed in the name of Jesus. Amen. Coming into land. Biggest lie ever told in church. <laughs> Apart from the worship leaders. Sing it one more time. <laughs> Never sing it one more time, do we? I am the door. John 10, 7. Shepherds. We love shepherds, don't we? As Christians, we love a bit of shepherd action. Red sky at night, shepherd's delight. Blue sky at night, day. Um, the, the, the shepherd, the, the wonderful analogy. Um, and, and obviously for us, we don't really get shepherds because the shepherding today is nothing like it was then. But back in the day, back when I was a lad, being a shepherd was real tough. You, you shepherds don't know you're born, do you, cat? Aye, you're not wrong. Yeah. Shepherding in those days was a pretty dangerous task. Uh, what does David tell us in 1 Samuel 17? He tells us he's killed the lion, he's killed the bear. This is not a kind of nice wear a padded jacket, drive a quad bike around your field kind of occupation. This is hardcore. And Jesus tells us that he is the door. And I never understood that because I knew it was a sheep analogy, but not being a farmer myself, having been born and raised in Buckinghamshire, not f I wasn't ever au okay fait with farming metaphor. And I did some research on this. Uh, and what I found out is that the sheep pen, the sheep fold, uh, 
out in the fields would have essentially just been a big circle of rocks. And there would be a little bit that would just be an, an opening in the rock. And the shepherd would lead the sheep into the fold and then would literally lay down in the gap. That's what the shepherd did. And that makes him the door. He is the door to the sheep pen. And Jesus says, I am he that is the door. I am the door. And as night fell, the shepherd would become the barrier that stopped the sheep getting eaten up by the wolves and the bears and the whatever else is roaming around the countryside trying to eat the sheep. There was no gate to close. And Jesus is the door. He literally lays down in the gap to stop us getting devoured by the enemy. Literally becoming the door to the sheep. I went on a five-minute tirade with our students the other day about how because of millennium, millennials, there is literally now no word for literally, but let's not go into that tonight because time is short. And I got a little heated. I am the door, reiterating the fact that only through him salvation is possible. He is the door by which we pass through, but also when he lays down in the gap, he is protecting us from that which, that which would seek to devour us. Some of us tonight, I believe, are feeling unsafe either in relationships with others or needing to know the protection of God. Uh, some of us are feeling exposed. If that is you, if you feel unsafe in relationships at the moment, if you feel unsafe um, just in general, like there's a, there's a, that you, you, have, you do not have peace because you're worried about your safety, either in relationships, like it feels unsafe in terms of relational stuff that's going on, or there's a, an actual concern for your physical safety. I would like to ask you to stand and I would like to pray for you. Bless you, madam. What's your name? Juliana, you're awesome. I think you're great, and I think God's got big things for you tonight. Why don't you just stretch out a hand to Juliana? I bless your transparency, your vulnerability, and the fact that you've been Johnny on the spot, jumping up for everything that God has for you. And I bless you to know that the hungry always get fed. I bless you to know that God's heart towards you it has been warm tonight as he's seen that vulnerability. And just like the woman, in the, well, uh, the woman at the well in John 4, when he sees her say, I have no husband, he says, that is beautiful. The, the word he uses, kelos, it means you have said it beautifully. I find your vulnerability. I find your honesty. I find your integrity. I find your transparency to be beautiful. And I bless you to know that the Lord finds your integrity to be beautiful. You are a woman of integrity. You are a woman who means what she says and says what she means. The words that you speak have power. I bless you to know that the Lord has blessed you to decree a thing and see it established. And I just bless you also to know that the Lord is increasing your authority to speak to situations and see them shifted. I bless you to know that the mountains that are standing before you at the moment, even with the faith of a mustard seed, you can command that mountain to be uprooted and planted into the sea. I bless you to know that you're made in the image of a creator who when he speaks, worlds are created. He creates worlds with his words. And I bless you to know that the Lord has given you because of the integrity you walk in, because of the vulnerability and because of your honesty, he's giving you the ability to speak to these situations that you're facing at the moment and see them shifted in the name of Jesus. So we bless you, whatever it is that's going on in your life at the moment, to know that this day, make a note of this day, this is when it all changes in the name of Jesus. So God, just for each and every one of us who are standing, I just bless you to receive the promise of safety, that you are safe in his hands. That doesn't mean that everything's always easy. God, we wish it were always easy. We wish when we said yes to Jesus that all our problems went away. But God, that's not our experience. Our experience is that we have something even better than our problems going away. And that is you living inside of us. We thank you, Jesus. I thank you, Jesus, that I don't have a life without problems. I thank you, Jesus, that I have a life that's hidden in you. Come what may, we trust you, Jesus. Receive today the truth that he is the door. He lays in the gap. He stands in the gap literally right now. Literally. We literally have a word for literally. He is literally, even now, as scripture teaches us, standing before the throne, making intercession on your behalf. He is your advocate. He is your strong tower. The Lord your God is strong to deliver. He's mighty to save. And I bless you right now to be quieted by his love. He will quiet you with his love. And even now, he's rejoicing over you with singing. He's rejoicing over you with singing. rejoicing over you with singing. He's rejoicing over you. And you're safe in his arms. Come Holy Spirit. I'm just going to stick a moment longer on this.
is safe. He is safe. Receive the truth today that you are safe. bless each and every one of you right now to receive fresh revelation of his love towards you, his protection over you. We speak against any scheme or plan of the enemy that would seek to rob you of your joy, that would seek to rob you of your peace. We speak against any sleep problems that have come as a result of this. And we silence the lies of the enemy over your life right now. We decree and declare that you were bought at a price. You are the possession and the property of the most high king of kings. And the Lord of Lords. And we forbid the enemy from having any, any influence in terms of making you feel unsafe. You are our rock, Jesus. Our strong deliverer. Our refuge, our very present help in time of need. Our shield and our rampart. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Please be seated. Bless you guys. Thank you for your honesty. going to skip ahead and just finish on the resurrection and the life. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Actually, I've been really disobedient. I'm sorry. Would you guys stand again? <laughs> I'm really sorry. Rob? Forgive me for being mindful of time. When God's doing stuff, I'm really sorry. <laughs> Far be it from me to have a plan. <laughs> I'm not going to do the last point. I'm really sorry that I was disobedient. Holy Spirit, please come back. And this is the body sacrificing for the parts of the body that need some help right now. Um, I felt what I, was, what I didn't do in the interest of time, which we're now going to do, is I felt Rob had a song to sing over you guys who are standing about uh, the door and, and needing to feel safe. And so I felt like he's got a song of deliverance to sing. And so I'm just going to encourage you, um, if you're receiving right now, to stand and, and to actually stand. And I felt um, that God is saying, actually, part of what he's calling you to do in this season is just to stand. Having done all, stand. And you have your armor, and we're going to pray that over you. Those of you who are ministering to the people stood, we're, we're going to start to pray the, the armor of God over these people. But having done all, stand. Your job is to stand. And there's a song of deliverance that's coming over you, and, and we're going to finish with this. We're going to have some ministry. And so, uh, ministry team, if you could just be on hand. And for those of you just sat, I would encourage you just to just to stretch a hand, and we're just going to do ministry where people are stood, and we'll just spend some time on this. Beth, would you stand on behalf of your dear mum? Thank you, Lord. So, Holy Spirit, would you come now? And for each other, Every one of my dear brothers and sisters that are stood, thank you for the privilege of standing with you. And I, I bless you to know that right now is not about charity, it's about solidarity. We stand with you. And if you're just next to these guys, would you just as a symbolic act, as a prophetic act, just stand with them? And we're, we're standing with you now, church. <laughs> and so we're just going to go into ministry now and Rob's going to sing. Is Zach around? Is that Keenan? Would you come and play? Is that okay for, for Rob?
as Rob prophesies over you right now. Holy Spirit is the ministry team tonight. 
And so if you want to encounter and experience him, then just present a posture of receiving. You can have your hands out. You can kneel. You can just go low where you are. You can come up to the front. Uh, This is how we're finishing the service today. If a ministry team member puts your his hand on your shoulder or her hand then that's great but Holy Spirit is is the main ministry team tonight and so we're not going to be too structured about this you can just come up to the front go to the back kneel down where you are but just allow God to minister to you right now wherever you are whatever it is that he's doing just give space for it right now just as as uh, Zach and Rob just minister to us right now Holy Spirit, just come and come and do what you want to do. And if you need to go, then we release you. Thank you for allowing the, the body to receive ministry tonight. We we honor you for that. But if you just want to stay a little longer, we're just gonna tarry a little bit longer.
I believe there's something that uh, Tom is carrying from tonight, something that he just stepped into, anointing there. I think it's got something to do with obedience and just throwing your plan out the window. And so I just want to offer a chance right now, just if you just want to get an anointing of what Tom's just walking in, um, he may explain that in a second. But I, I just want to invite you to come forward right now, just if you just want to receive just um, a measure of what Tom's walking in. He'll just come and lay hands um, and just impart what, what God's just given to him. I felt specifically it was um, fear of man and people pleasing. And so if that's something you're struggling with, um, it's something I struggle with still. <laughs> and it's something that, yeah, it's a, it's a tough one. And I just feel like Jesus is just doing away with the fear of man because it's the stuff that holds us back from actually being in tune with him because we're actually all designed and wired to be spirit-led. But I don't have anything to prove because he's proved it all for me. And so I'm going to pray for everyone just generally and then I'll come around and minister. But just right now, I just speak to the fear of man and command it to go. And that's all I'm going to say. Because the fear of man tells me that I have to pray a big prayer. Otherwise, people won't believe that it's happening. The fear of man tells me that unless I do something grandiose and whoop and shout and jump around and hype it up, that people won't believe that they've received by faith. But do you know what? being set free of the fear of man tells me that that's your problem and not mine. So fear of man, go. Because we're not scared of you. Spirit, that's the only hope we ever have of truly being us. So as father of this house, I ask each and every one of you to step up and to be you. Because I need you, we need you, the person next to you needs you to be you. The fear of man will stop you being you. the fire landing. So as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And thus endeth our service. So I'm going to pray and, and just move around and minister and so are the team, but just bless you if you're here and you're new. We'd love to connect with you. We'd love to get to know you. We'd love to help you get plugged into what we call church family, which is scrapping the sermon and letting people ugly cry because sometimes that's just what we need to do. So be blessed in the name of Jesus. Amen. If you are able-bodied, we would love some help with set down as we've run massively over our time. So once you're done being prayed for, which will be quick, some extra help with the set down. Thank you.